Hey everybody, it's Deborah Carter here with Preparation Tech. Today, we've got another great interview as part of our Black History Month 2021 series. Today, I'm speaking with Marty Burris, who comes highly recommended by the Women in Tech Regatta. Now, you got to know Marty because she is all things product management, and she's just a wealth of information, and she's here to tell us a bit more about this profession. So welcome, Marty. Let's start off with you telling us what you do and how it relates to technology. Yeah, thanks for that intro. It was so warm. Uh, my name is Marty Burris. I'm director of product at Salesforce, and I am here to talk to you all about what product management is. So if you think about how technology is created, um, everyone always thinks software engineers and they're just tinkering away at the computers. And that is true. However, typically someone has to help them figure out what they should build, right? They're going to help figure out what it should look like, how it should interact, what the screens or pages should be, how you flow through the system. Um, that is your product manager. Your product manager doesn't just stop there. That's just what they do with engineers. They're also responsible for how it gets marketed, how it is branded. Um, I'm even working on a commercial right now. So we're, we're highly involved with that part. And then, which I think is the most exciting and the part I love most about my job is product managers are typically decide are who decide what's the next thing. So a question I get a lot from my executive team is, what's the next big thing we're building this year, next year, or just in the next few months? So I'm really excited to talk about that um, and what that means, but that is essentially what a product manager is. Wow, so that's a very exciting job because it's really important in the company, right? You're actually creating the future, helping the company create the future. Yeah, and that's what I always try to tell people. Um, product management, um, the reason it's such like a, a highly sought after field um, and, and high paying field is because um, that is what you're doing. You there. Every CEO of every major tech company was a product manager first. There's not one that I know of that was never a product manager, whether it's Zuckerberg, Bezos, Bill Gates, you name it, they were all PMs at one point. And I would say probably the greatest PM most people know of is Steve Jobs. Um, and the way he would think about the future and what we do and how we interact with software and technology, that is what a product manager does. And so it's your job to figure out what the next big thing is and how people will interact with technology for the the rest of the time. <laughs> so. Wow. So to bring this really close to home so that people are crystal clear, can you give us a concrete example of a product that you're working on at the moment to demonstrate product management? Yeah, I would give you something most people are going to understand right away. Right now I'm working on pandemic software. <laughs> so Whoa. we're all in a pandemic. So a year ago, I got asked to start help thinking about how we would solve some of the issues that we see in a pandemic. And because I specifically work more with large company enterprise software, right? How do big companies help with this, right? And so Salesforce, which is my company, has been a big part of how we think about that. And so we started off with building things like contact tracing. And if you're unfamiliar with that, it's that little survey that you have to take that says, hey, I haven't been sick every time you go somewhere. We were building out some of those things to help big companies do that. Um, and so now you see it everywhere. It's like standard for going into a place, but we made all that up as PMs a year ago. Like <laughs> that was not real. And we all just standardized on one way of doing it um, with some guidance from the CDC, of course. Um, things like um, shift management, um, space plan planning. So if you notice now everywhere you go only allows a certain amount of capacity. Companies didn't just know how to do that a year ago. You need software to start to think about, okay, how do I track how many people are in a space at a time or in an office space at a time? And we needed software for that. Or simpler, similar, uh, really simple things like visitors coming into a space. So think um, someone who you don't know anything about needs to come. So as easy examples, like when I go get to a nail salon or something, right? They have to have, they have to go through a process of knowing who I was when I came um, was I sick or not? Um, because if there is an outbreak, that's how you can reach back out to people and let them know um, that they've been exposed to COVID. So I worked on that and now I've pivoted and now I'm working on what um, the future work looks like now that everybody's working from home and so many companies have announced work from home forever. So um, yeah, those are some of the things. Wow, so you are like on the cutting edge. This is so cool. It's a fun time in my career. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, I can imagine because there are things that you're working on that you couldn't have envisioned like a year ago. It's crazy. Yep. 
So give us an idea of the whole process, the creative process that goes into developing these new products. Uh, yeah, so everyone's process is a little different. Um, and so it depends on where you are and what stage of product management. So um, it's probably fair to tell you that like, you don't just start off with these big things. You could, but most people don't, right? You, the way I always explain it is if you start off towards um, the bottom of product management, right? Or the first job most people get, which is what we call an associate product manager, or APN. Basically, um, you get to solve small problems like how buttons look on a page, um, maybe how something feels. So if you're thinking like Facebook, right? You might get to work on um, creating a new tab at the top of a window or something like that. Then you move up into PM. Maybe you get to own a piece of the front page, right? A corner of the page. You move to senior PM, you maybe own a half a page or even the whole page. And as a senior PM, I had huge responsibilities. Um, and then you move into director, senior director, VP and all those things, right? And as you can imagine, things grow. So I just wanted to set that level, set that. So for me in my role, um, after being a PM for, for five years now, basically my creative process is my executives come to me and they say, hey, I'll, I'll give the pandemic a great example, right? Hey, we wanna be involved in the pandemic. We want to, um, to help figure out what help looks like and what we can do given you know, the technology in this time frame. Cool. And so after you like lose it for a second and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa what is this? <laughs> um, you start. And one of the biggest things that a PM has to really fine tune is that creative process. So how do you go from idea to, to product? And so for me, it starts with thinking about, okay, who do I want to help? What do I want to solve? And what impact do I want to make? Um, and once I start to figure those pieces out, then I can start getting into more of what does that look like? What data do I need to support that decision? How do I you know, start to form hypotheses or do experiments? What do those look like? Um, and then essentially from there, those start to get into um, essentially use cases and um, you know, mock-ups of, of things. And that's where I start to bring more people into my process, have bring in design. I start having some conversations, early conversations with engineering um, and sometimes even marketing to get a feel, right? Depending on the type of product I'm building. And then once we get it there um, and we start to fine tune it some more and we get it down to what we think we want to do in terms of how it looks, how it functions um, and how we want to market it, then we start to develop on it. Um, and then of course we iterate um, based on customer feedback, based on um, how our tests go. And people don't even realize this. You get tested all the time in software. You don't even sometimes realize it. Um, I know it because I'm used to it and I know what it looks like, but most people don't even realize when they're in a, a an experiment or something like that and a PM or something is trying out, um, should something look a certain way? Um, but an easy way and an easy example would be like, if you use Netflix, you notice now in your Netflix, when you come into the homepage, you get a shuffle button. That would be an example of an experiment. They're trying to figure out, okay, for all the people who don't know what to watch, what if we just said shuffle and then we shuffle to them things that might fit their preferences that they may not normally click on. That would be an example of an experiment and you don't even realize they're experimenting on you. And one day, sometimes you might log in and you don't see that button. Or one day you might log in, in the future and it won't be there. And it was just an experiment. They were just trying something. And the other thing with experiments too is a lot of times only a subset of people get them. Um, but yeah, that is, that's how we do it. Wow, I did not know that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna push that shuffle button because I wanna see push what happens. Button. Yeah, cool. So I see before me someone who's got a lot of experience, very passionate about product management. Tell us how you got to be Marty Boris, the product management diva. Tell us about your childhood. How did you grow up? What were your favorite subjects? Did you have hobbies and interests? Who were your role models? Yeah, so this is always an interesting conversation. Um, so I grew up, you know, pretty humble beginnings. Um, you know, I grew up with a little small town in Wisconsin. I have six siblings. Yes, six siblings. And for the most part, we all grew up together. We're pretty spread out in age. So, you know, some people aged out before the little ones were born. But for the most part, we were all together at some point. I lived with all my siblings at some point um, in their lifetime um, before we all even grew up. And so um, growing up, I would say my biggest influence was my dad. My dad didn't even graduate from high school. Um, he got a GED later. But he was a huge reader and he was super interested in innovation and technology. And that's all he ever wanted to talk about. And so the bug first started there. Um, 
because we that's all we would talk about was how we would improve things, how we would tweak things. He taught me a lot about like patents and creating things and what that looks like. Um, and then a big thing too for my parents was education. Um, and so I ended up being the first person in both sides of my family to graduate from college. Wow. Uh, and so a lot of that came from that early conversations around like, you know, you got to go to college, you got to get education. You know, my dad would drop me off to school and we'd always do this stupid thing. And he'd be like, uh, why am I sending you to school? And I'd be like, to get an education. And then I, you know, I'd get out of the car, but he was doing that to me well into college years. He would call me <laughs> in college and, and, and ask me why he was sending me to college. Uh, so, so those were some of those things. And I would say the only thing I think it's interesting, and this is very specific to me. Um, people always ask like, who are your role models growing up? I don't think I had specific role models. I would look at pieces of people and be like, I want to do a little bit of that. And but there was never like a certain person, like I can't go back to a single person. I was like, I want to be just like them. But there was traits that I would see in people that I liked. And so I think I'm a representation of all these different traits that I saw in people that I wanted to create. And I ended up creating my own role model, um, I would say. And the person doesn't have a name, but they're a combination of all these different things. And as I've gotten older, that hasn't gone away. One of the things I always tell people is um, don't stop dreaming when you become an adult. Um, don't lose that process, right? And so now that I'm older, there's still people that I just completely admire and I want to be like. Um, but there's, for me, there's not someone who is exactly what I want. Like my dream um, would probably be to be um, the head of product for a major tech company. There is no black person, no black woman. I don't think any woman actually that's ever held those positions. So there isn't a person that I dream of, but there are people who've gotten really close. And, and so I look to them for inspiration. Okay, so you completed bachelor's degrees in, let's see here, organizational leadership and selling and sales management. Tell mm -hmm. us about what you learned and did these this specific study help you get into product management? Yeah, so to answer the immediate question, absolutely, I'm using my degrees, absolutely my degrees helped me get into product. And then the way that I use them wasn't the way that I intended when I got in them, but they, I definitely still use both of them today. And so the organizational leadership degree basically is, if you've heard about organizational psychology or any of that, it taught me how to look at an organization and figure out the motivations, the interests, um, how to um, help people respond and move to change. And as a product manager, that's very important because every few months I'm going to a group of people and I'm saying, this is the big thing. And then you're gonna change what you're doing to start working towards that vision. And then the other thing is I have to bring people on that vision and journey with me. So I actually think it's one of the best degrees you can get um, to get into product management because that is so much a part of my job is inspiring people around the vision. And then the second part, which is the sales management, absolutely. What's the point of building a product that you can't sell? <laughs> and don't get me wrong, you know, there's like nonprofit products and things like that, but most of the, the products that I work on require, you know, to be sold, you know? Um, and so one of the things that I do a lot is I go in um, on sales deals with uh, my sales team and I come in as a product expert and I talk about um, why a company or a customer should buy our products. Um, and so it is very, very useful um, to be able to go home, go in and do that and uh, help sell a lot of deals that way. And I think the other thing that is not as I would say talked about, but a huge part of product management as you get more senior is around partnerships. Um, if you if you have any experience with product, you hear about the build versus buy scenario um, and understanding when to do that and understanding how to broker those partnerships. My sales degree helps me do that every day. So yeah, those would, those would be my, my things. <laughs> and coming back to that now, you're a guest lecturer at something called the Product School, which I'd never yep. heard of before, which is so cool. And this provides specialized product management training. So how are you in the school recruiting and training talent? Because I assume that this program is specifically to cultivate, to nurture, to educate product managers. Yeah, so um, it does a couple of things. So they want to kind of inspire, educate the new crop of product managers, but they also do a lot for people who are already in product. And so for me, I, I love teaching that if I could 
somehow, I, w I wouldn't change what I was doing, but if I could make that more critical part of my days teaching, I would, I would find a lot of joy in that. And so product school gives me an opportunity. So um, pretty much anyone can join. It's a website you can join, but they also have a lot of free content on YouTube. They do webinars. They, I think there's like Slack groups or something. There's a lot of free content too. So you don't have to just pay for it. Just get involved in the community um, because I actually didn't pay for any content or do any certifications or something like that to become a PM. Um, I watched all the free stuff. You know, I learned from, from going to free things, talking to people in, in my network, how to, how to become a, a good PM. And then for me specifically, I teach. And so I share pretty much the tricks of the trade um, that I've learned over the years uh, of what makes a good product manager, what are common obstacles. I like to talk about the flip side, which is usually the, uns the, the parts that aren't sunny, the hard stuff. Um, so I find so much of the content is rooted in like, um, almost like marketing type stuff, like, you know, like, oh, here's Glamour, be the CEO of your product. And I'm like, when someone gets in the job, they're gonna realize very quickly that is not true. And so I wanna create product managers who wanna do this and who wanna stay in this career and have a long career like me. And so I try to tell them the things that'll, that'll make sure they can keep going. And this segue is really great into my next question. What are the biggest challenges that you face as a black woman in tech? And more specifically, what are the strategies you've developed to overcome those challenges? Yeah, so um, I, there's, there's definitely challenges. Um, and I would liken it to, if you've ever heard about the challenge that the black quarterback faces in football. And for a long time in football, we heard about how, you know, you hear about these great black quarterbacks and then they get to like, you know, professional level and then they'd be like, they'd be put into another position because for so long, we did not see black people as being capable of leading, right? And much like how football has a quarterback, technology has a product manager. And because we have this huge job of figuring out what the next big thing is, um, a lot of times we are not celebrated for being technologists, for being innovators, even though most of the technology that we interact with in the world today was either built by, created, or designed by black people. Um, but, and so that can be very discouraging um, and, and you feel it all the time. Usually it's in the form of microaggressions, people just being intimidated by you, people projecting on you, or people just questioning who you are and how you show up. How you, I remember when I first became a PM, I was just always so frustrated because a million PMs could present an idea, but they would drill me. Where did you get your research? How do you know? How are you sure? And it would be so hard. And so what I had to learn was, I can't change the rules. This is, this is the game that I'm in. But I've always looked at my career as kind of this Trojan horse. And so as I keep going, I let people in along the way. And so that's why it's so important for me to teach and for me to give back because um, I, I realize that I am in, a, in the crop of a small amount of people who can open the door. Um, and so um, I make the point to do that. And while I'm in there, I try to change processes because uh, what happens is once I gain people's respect, they're like, oh yeah, she's our friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I, I kindly remind them like, okay, but let's, let's back up a little bit because this was my experience getting here. And this was, you know, these were all the doors that and the walls that were put up in place. Um, and so I try to explain that to them. And, and then that always helps me to open the door for more. And so I love that most teams that I've been on or companies I've, I've been on have left a lot more diverse than, than when I came, so. Awesome. I'm just, I'm just blown away by you and what you've done. I'm so impressed. Question for you. You've launched Folding Chair, which is an initiative to help underrepresented uh, people, groups to get into product management. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah. So Folding Chair is my baby. It is probably one of the things I'm most proud of. Um, and so it started I think it's been three years now, um, three, four years ago. And basically I was, I, I just moved to the Bay Area and um, I, I went to a, a tech meetup. It was one of my first ones. And there was a student there from Stanford um, and she had seen me, you know, raise my hand and, you know, present who I was or whatever. And she came up after and she goes, I've never met a black PM. I've never met a black female PM when you mentor me. And I'm like, Mentor you, like, I'm just, you know, I don't know. I'm sure if you want me to, you know, I'll do it. And so 
and mentoring her. And she ended up getting her first job in products and all of that. Um, and then she said, you should do this for more people. You have a gift. And I'm like, I don't know about that. And so I just put out something on LinkedIn and I said, free career coaching, anybody who wants career. And I was flooded with people. And so that was really the beginning of folding chair. And so because there's so many people, I had to step back and almost PM it a bit. Like, and I had to think back, like, what do I want to do? Who do I want to help? And what is the impact that I want to leave, right? And for me, it was going back to what I knew, which was when I first got into tech, I wanted to see, like I said, I wanted to see people like me and I didn't. And so um, I started creating that for people, being that person that they knew. Um, I would help people through interviews. I helped them. With coaching in some cases I actually do full teaching from start to finish um, I try not to do those as much because they take so much time where I, I can help 10 students versus you know one or two if I'm teaching from scratch so I try to help some that are more further along and they come from all walks of life and I think that's what makes it to me more exciting and fulfilling um, and so I think the craziest one that I always share is um, I started off with a friend who was bartending. She had a degree and everything, but she was bartending at actually a strip club. And she reached out and she said, you know, Marty, I want to do something different. I want to change. And her degree was actually, you know, in something completely unrelated. It was not tech, right? Um, and then now she, she works in Microsoft <laughs> and she's been a product manager at Microsoft for several years now. So, um, that is just like one story, right? But there's so many amazing stories of people coming from um, non-traditional backgrounds. And, th and those are my favorites, um, non-traditional backgrounds and, and landing those first jobs and products. Since I started, I think we've created 5 million in salaries for um, black and brown people. And so, and when I say that number of people are always like, oh, what do you mean? I'm like, I don't create the jobs. I help them get the jobs. And so when we get the job, I think about the salary that they, you know, that they are able to get. And if you think about that, for all the people I've helped over the last few years, we have totaled over $5 million of helping people um, get their first or second jobs. And they're at companies all over the world. Companies you and I go to all the time, we interact with. And you, anyone who knows anything about technology knows that technology is representative, representative of the people who are building it. And so it's important to have diverse faces in product because we have such an integral role and in making sure um, the products that are released to the world um, are, are things that are going to work for everybody, not just the majority. What companies? Can you list some of the companies that you Yeah, have? so I have folks at Capital One, McDonald's, Workday, Google, Facebook, Coinbase, you name it. There have been so many, you know, um, tons of startups, like, yeah, they're Microsoft, like so many, so many companies. And so uh, it's just, it's just been exciting. And I think I always tell them my favorite text is I got the job. And, and then because folding chair is free, the only ask of folding chair um, graduates or coaches is um, that they pay it for. It. And the next time somebody DMs them cold on LinkedIn looking for help that they help. And, and oh, so that's how I we, love we, this, giving it, paying it forward. This has been a great interview, Marty. I've got one last question for you. And often yeah. it's like the one that everybody goes, hmm. But how are you, Marty Burris, making tech history? How, what kind of legacy do you want to leave in the Black community and in society in general? Um, I think I'm making my history every day. Um, and I don't think I'm there yet. But when I, I always think about, I do this exercise a lot where I think about what my kids are going to say about me. Granted, I don't even have any kids, so I'm thinking kind of <laughs> forehead here. Um, but I always think about that, like, okay, what are my kids, you know, one day gonna say their mom did? And for me, um, I don't know what it looks like, but I do know that whatever it is that I do, I wanna build software that leaves a lasting impression on how the world works. Whether that is, um, you know, in technology through the pandemic, if that is in transportation, whatever that is, right? But I wanna be able to look back and say, the world is different because I worked on this piece of technology that people are using today and that that was my thing. And so I'm getting there. We'll see what it ends up being. I have no doubt that it's not going to be one thing. It's going to be many things with you. Marty, thank you so much for your time and your insights and your energy. And I look forward to keeping to tracking you and seeing what great things you're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that.